this week we have some cool stuff. One is the retailers and reporting on Threadripper performance. We have something to add to that after talking to some vendors. Uh, 1900X CCX configuration, some news on peripherals at the show at PAX West, and a couple of other news items as well. Because there was so much news while we've been traveling, we'll have a second hardware news video probably going out tomorrow or the next day to add to this one because there are a few other topics that are worth talking about in separate detail. Before getting to that, this content is brought to you by the Thermaltake Flow RGB closed loop liquid cooler, which is a 360 millimeter radiator plus three 120 fans that are RGB illuminated. The Thermaltake rain fans at that. This is a 4.5 gen Azatec pump, which is one of the faster pumps. You can learn more at the link in the description below. So the first news item, news from one of Europe's largest retailers suggests that AMD's combined CPU sales to DIY enthusiasts have now surpassed Intel's combined CPU sales to enthusiasts at that particular retailer. We wanted to add to this story. So speaking with vendors, the word on the street is that looking at X299 versus X399, the vendors with whom we've spoken have said that the first few days to first week, depending on which vendor, of sales for X399 products, related products, uh, surpassed the first month of Intel X299 product sales from those same vendors. Not retailers, but actual manufacturers. So uh, from the X299 standpoint, that makes sense. We've seen on the media side a lot more interest in Threadripper than in Intel's enthusiast platform. Part of that is because people are bored of Intel. Part of it is because AMD is coming back in a big way, and this is their first high-end desktop part in a long time. They've done server, they've done some level of enthusiast, but this is HEDT from a company that's finally competing with Intel in the space. So I think that's why a lot of the interest in Threadripper is out, but specifically on the vendor side, the manufacturers seen increased sales in the first few days, the first week of Threadripper X399 parts versus the first month of X299 is a big deal. That means that they're going to have to ramp up production because I think Threadripper is doing better than a lot of manufacturers expected. And I think X299 is doing worse than a lot of manufacturers expected. So, uh, But that was just to build on the news about Mind Factory and their sales with X399. Well, not just that, but Ryzen as well, where if you look at the charts they've published, the AMD parts to DIY enthusiasts are finally surpassing Intel again. Two, two items to note here. One, at that particular retailer, so at Mind Factory, and two, that's DIY enthusiasts. So while this is a major victory for AMD and one that's critical for their continued success in the CPU department, uh, AMD still has to fight back for a share in OEM systems, in laptops, and things like that. So the war is far from over. They've got a lot more ground to gain, but this is a good start for Ryzen and Threadripper, and, uh, and hopefully we should see the effects of that competition soon. And that will be in the form of Coffee Lake. So we'll have more information on Coffee Lake when the time has come, but that it's looking like Intel sirens on right now. They have had Coffee Lake more or less in the wings. Uh, this is, CPUs take a while to develop. So these things may have been taped out for a while now. It's possible they've been manufacturing the silicon for Coffee Lake since Ryzen launched or before Ryzen launched. The design has been done for at least a year, I, looking at a refresh uh, or a uh, the old TikTok cycle, the cadence was about 18 months from design to shelf for an architecture that already existed when they were iterating on it. So that means that Coffee Lake's probably been more or less ready in that it was being produced as Ryzen was coming out and starting to make waves. So it's not like this is a full response to AMD, but uh, the parts that are, one, we, we don't know if Intel would have released the rumored 6-core i5s and the rumored 6-core 12-thread i7s without some pressure. We also don't know if Intel would have branded, for example, their i9 CPUs as i9 CPUs without the Threadripper pressure. So even if it's parts that already existed or would have existed, having the marketing, the branding, and the naming shift to move to i9s and other marketing segments like focusing on streaming for example with the 7900x that shift is definitely somewhat of a response to threadripper and and ryzen so uh, intel's responding in some form which is good I, that's what we need to see intel kind of needed a, 
uh, kick in the rear end to get moving again. So it looks like that's happened. And to be fair to Intel, it's not easy to do what they do. So it's not like the company has stagnated or has tried to stagnate and has gotten lazy. It's just that it's hard to keep pushing CPU performance when you've already shrunken the process so far. Uh, but there's still room to improve and it looks like they're they're finally acting on that in a more public, visible fashion for enthusiasts, not just servers. Other AMD news before moving on. The 1900X CCX configuration was somewhat detailed by TPU, Tech Power Up. So they learned that the 1900X is running a core configuration that's the same as the other Threadripper chips. So four dies, top left, bottom right, uh, oriented, I believe, right side up, uh, are the two active dies. And then on those, one CCX is disabled each. And this gives the CCXs all the usual access to memory channels and I.O., and keeps the eight megabyte L3 cache per CCX available. Should also help with reducing latency, particularly in memory intensive operations, which would be the ideal solution to keep gaming reasonably accessible on the 1900X as it's more likely to be used in systems that are doing some level of gaming as opposed to the 1950X where it's more likely to be in workstations. And side note on that, just with the launch of the 1900X, AMD has lowered the cost of entry into their HEDT series of CPUs. So Threadripper 1900X CPUs are eight core 16 thread variants, priced at $550, making them slightly more expensive than an 1800X, but adding another run to AMD's product performance ladder. The 1900X is clocked at 3.8 gigahertz, 4.0 boost, 64 PCIe lanes and a 180 watt TDP. This is something you primarily use for the lanes uh, and Ryzen 7 or really Ryzen 5 would be the better option for gaming if that's your pure, pure focus. If you're trying to stick with AMD, you would want probably a Ryzen 5 1600 class CPU. Whereas if you're going higher end gaming, the Intel i7 7700K is still the best there is presently. Now, Coffee Lake will shake that up quite a bit, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, so yeah, 1900X is a cheaper option in AMD's HEDT platform. In non-AMD news, PCIe Gen 4 is supposed to land this year and PCIe Gen 5 has been fast-tracked for 2019. And this is information obtained at the Hot Chips 2017 conference, which indicates that the PCIe 4.0 standard is set to arrive this year, rendering the 4.0 specification fleeting. 4.0 is supposed to bring with it 16 giga transfer per second and 64 gigabytes per second of throughput while 5.0 will effectively double that. If PCIe 4.0 does indeed get ratified this year, it'll mark a seven year gap between the launch of 3.0 and the ratification of 4.0, which is a long gestation period that the PCI SIG group ascribes to industry stagnation as the 3.0 interface has afforded adequate bandwidth and throughput for many years. It wasn't until the advent of AI, machine learning, and increasing popularity of NVMe-based storage that more bandwidth was needed. There are also a lot of smaller announcements or subtle launches at PAX in the peripheral cases and cooling department. So we'll go through those quickly. Gigabyte's got a new CPU cooler that they showed at PAX. We don't know the name of their cooler or their case. Uh, the rep with whom we were speaking represented motherboards, not cases and coolers, so didn't know the names. But we've got footage of them. So there's new CPU cooler. It's got two 120 millimeter fans. And I think it includes an angled screwdriver for installation. So I, I don't know that it's going to be the easiest cooler in the world to install. But they're trying to do coolers. And it's it's just another, you know, you see these companies that traditionally do motherboards and things like that expanding into coolers and cases. A lot of it is for margin because margin in motherboards is really bad. Margin in video cards is even worse. You're talking less than 10% margins for best case scenarios. So to add peripherals, coolers and cases means that they can produce products that are much higher margin, not sell as many and still walk away better off than they were before. And that's why you're seeing companies start doing this more. So they've got a CPU cooler. Uh, there was a gigabyte case that housed the cooler. That's a new case. It's got exceptionally limited airflow on the front sort of like the EVGA DG7, sort of like half the other cases on the market right now, pretty disappointed in that trend. And we didn't get a ton of information about it other than that, but that's that's what we know from the Gigabyte side. On the Corsair side, they had their Void Pro headset present, which was shown off somewhat recently. They added an antenna to the transmitter, updated the memory foam in the ear cups, and then there's also a new microphone that's got a 50% larger driver. The drivers for the output have also been tuned for 
uh, frequency to some extent. And aside from that, uh, there's Dolby Surround on some models. It's available in USB 3.5 and wireless options. HyperX also had a new version of the Cloud headset. So this one was the first Cloud model done in-house. They've done the Stainer and whatever the other one was, the Revolver in-house previously, whereas the first two Clouds were partnered with QPad. The Cloud Alpha is a $100 headset set to either pre-order or ship on September 25th. It's got inline controls, an extension cable, 2.3 meter cable on with uh, extension plus what's coming out of the headset. New memory foam and ID, there's new stitching. And the interesting part is it's got a dual chamber driver. So it's a 50 millimeter driver. Uh, the driver on the sides of it has basically venting ports where some of the sound escapes. And those are, as I understand it, vertically stacked in a way that one port vents into a smaller inner chamber in the ear cup and we have a, actually a cool 3d printout that's uh, dissected to show you for that and the lower port uh, outputs into another chamber so one's smaller one's larger the larger one helps with theoretically bass and this means that hyperx hasn't done a lot of tuning on the frequencies because they can just output the sound wave to each chamber and then i guess hope for the best on that so this isn't new to headsets but it's new to gaming headsets we're not sure exactly how well it works yet Keep an eye out for it, $100 on that one, and the uh, ear cup design is the most unique aspect of it. In Razer news, they have development of custom switches continued, and the Razer Purple switch is the newest one. It represents their foray into the world of optical switches. Optical switch technology stands to offer hot swappable switches with no debounce and the possibility of analog sensing, all of which is to say that optical switches could theoretically add more response and customization to keyboards. There's more than a few words that could be said on this topic, so definitely easier to refer to the sources for more information and a primer on optical switches should that be necessary. You can check out a Thomas Hardware article on the Razer Purple Optical Mechanical Switch if you're interested in more. And as for mice, Razer's got a new Basilisk gaming mouse aimed at the FPS devotee. It was announced at Europe's IFA, but was also at PAX. The Basilisk comes equipped with the same 16,000 DPI sensor the, I believe, 3389 that's found in the Death Adder Elite and Lance Head Tournament Edition. The mouse will offer Razer's mechanical mouse switches, on-the-fly DPI adjustment, and programmable buttons. So the thing here, the Basilisk mouse, honestly, looking at it in person and messing around with it, it's not that different from most of their other mice. Basically, the point of differentiation is they've added a small wheel on the bottom to adjust the resistance to the scroll wheel, so you can make it sort of close to a Logitech hyperscroll, except it doesn't actually hyperscroll. It's still, I mean, you can go like that and it still only goes one tick, whereas Logitech would spin for two minutes. So it's not quite there, but it is very low resistance or get to a point where it requires a lot of intentional force to move it. Now, is that that marketable a feature? I'm not sure. You, you'll set it once and you're never gonna touch it again. I guess the point is whether or not you set it to where most mice are anyway, which would largely invalidate the function, or if there's actually some usefulness there. Maybe a very small specific audience would like that kind of thing, but uh, it's just another mouse. It's the Basilisk, uh, seven, $70 for MSRP, and uh, the 3389 sensor. So another one of those chroma rgb i believe is also enabled on it and uh, that, that pretty much wraps up the mouse they also have their new blade pro which was at pax west and the blade pro is a it's the same as the previous laptop except it has a 1060 in it it's got the same dual fan cooling design uh priced at 2300 dollars, 120 hertz display and one thing here that's worth note is they do upgradable dims now so it's actually got dim slots instead of the soldered memory which is just really undesirable for the type of laptop we look at. So that's good to see it in the very least. In liquid cooling news, EK Waterblocks has made good on their promise to expand the fluid gaming series. And as of now, they offer a 120, 240, and 360 millimeter radiator expansion pack in addition to standalone GPU blocks, a multi GPU connector kit, and new soft tubing fittings in different colors and configurations, such as 45 degree and 90 degree adapters. So they're expanding this line to start approaching the kind of customization you get from other loops that are normally made of copper rather than aluminum. Additionally, the EK Supremacy AX aluminum block and compatible pump and reservoirs can be purchased individually, making buying a kit not required, 
but uh, the idea originally with the fluid gaming series was to make it so that you pick up one kit with everything in it, build your loop and you're done uh, to create sort of the uh, intro to cooling. So, or to open loop cooling anyway. So that's news from EK. News from Alpha Cool. They've got their new Ice Becker Helix and Helix Light Reservoirs. So this new family of reservoirs with the Ice Becker Helix is basically shaped like a DNA strand running the length of the reservoir interior. And the 60 millimeter model will include a UV cathode to eliminate UV reactive liquid. New reservoirs come in four colors, black, red, green, and blue with 50 and 60 millimeter sizes. And that's it for this news roundup for the last week. We'll have another one of these with more news items because more stuff has happened in the last few days. Got a couple cool topics to talk about. But as always, patreon.com slash gamers nexus helps out directly. We'll be back at home base soon to work on the usual in-depth testing coverage. In the meantime, subscribe for more. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.